Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Today we have our guest with us is Joshua Charles, and we're going to be talking about uh, a new book that he's just edited, The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. It sounds pretty gnarly, so I'm sure we're not going to, I'm sure you're going to want to stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. It's a beautiful morning here in, in paradise. We're recording this uh, early in the morning, just about sunrise. And we're, we're stoked to have as our guest today, Joshua Charles. We'll be introducing him in a moment and his book, The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. You know, you hear so much these days about conspiracy theories and things like that. Well, there is a big conspiracy. It started, it happened a long time ago when Satan and a third of the of the of the angels decided they were going to uh uh take take over heaven and uh and rebelled and they were cast out of they were cast out of heaven but satan uh they were cast out of heaven to to earth and so St satan uh, is referred to as the prince and ruler of this world uh, he's 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 still uh, roaming about seeking whom he can uh kill uh and destroy uh but the Bible also calls him, they call, it, it calls him the great dragon. But there's one specific verse that I love the most where it refers to him as the fleeing dragon. In other words, he's running. He's on the run. Uh, he may be um, using sweeping his tail right and left and, and, and wreaking a lot of havoc. But Jesus Christ picked a battle with him uh, on a place called Calvary. You know, I'm a ninja black belt, and we train a lot. Of, one of the things that we do is we stage the fight when someone wants to fight us. We give them the target. We 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 have a, we give them openings, uh, hoping that that's probably where they're going to strike. For example, in a knife fight, um, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to train with wooden knives, of course. But is to is to show show your opponent the opening, different openings, and if you give him give him an opening, there's a good chance he'll strike there, so you can anticipate what he's going to do. And then other good news is you know where what what uh, weapon he's going to use. He's not going to use his fist or his or his knee, or his elbow, or his foot. He's probably going to use that knife, and uh, and so in in a state in a, in a fight, um, you can stage that. And then you know, okay, the good news is he's got a knife. He's probably going to strike me here. So I'm going to respond when he does. I use a wrist throw or something, and to disarm him. And and also, I hate to say it so bluntly, but basically destroy him with his own weapon. And so that's really what Jesus did on Golgotha. He he picked up he he picked a time and the place that he had picked that he had fight the bully on the block and Satan's weapon is death. And Jesus destroyed death, right? On, on Golgotha dying, he destroyed death, rise, and he restored our life. So Jesus is the champion. Jesus is the victor. And when we're joined with Christ, we, we live in that victory too. Having said all that, there's, there continues to be a battle here until that, till the end of time. And one of those battles uh, uh, was talked about by Leo, Pope Leo the Eighth, uh, back in back 140 years ago, and then Monsignor George Dillon, uh, an Irish Catholic missionary, did a series of lectures uh, on uh, some of the things that Pope Leo was talking about, uh, specifically Freemasonry. Cardinal Ratzinger, when asked what's one of the most dangerous things in the world today, his response was simply Freemasonry. Very interesting, isn't it? That 140 years ago, a pope put his finger on the on, on the uh, on the main issue. But just remember this, Jesus said, if I, by the finger of God, cast out Satan, you know, he, that's what he does. He's like a flea on the collar. Jesus, Jesus uh, is the victor. Victor, Satan is a punk, but it's pretty good for us to be able to be, to know the wiles of the devil, not to over-focus on him, not to and, uh, aggrandize him, but to know who our enemy is. We don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be, um, uh, without without knowledge of of our enemy so to that end joshua charles let me tell you who he is he's a new york times best-selling author how cool is that joshua he's a <laughs> to say that he's a historian a classical, me as much as anybody <laughs> he's a classical pianist a former white house speechwriter. he has degrees in music government and law 
and he came into the Catholic Church from Protestant in 2009, and he used to be uh, the dictator of a small South American country. Is that right? <laughs> oh, you must have left it off your resume. Well, with, with my views these days, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably considered a fascist by many. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's I, traditional I, marriage and life. You're a fascist these days. So. Isn't that crazy? No, but I mean, it, it's a beautiful, short, little, brief little resume. I'm sure there's a lot more than that. Uh, but before we dig into this book, and the book, by the way, is The War of the Antichrist. Hold it up straight here. With a Church and Christian Civilization. It should be titled The War the Antichrist is going to lose. <laughs> is losing. But Joshua, can you just talk story a little bit about yourself? Uh, in just, you know, I know you're a a recent convert to call Catholicism, and that's always a real interest to me. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Bear. Very honored to be with you uh, and and your audience. Um, I came to the church essentially through reading the Church Fathers. I'm sure that's a story that are that is familiar with many. You see of all her. my, all, you see all my. Books oh yeah, I have a, <laughs> let me see if I can point I right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and is is a, that the commentaries up above? Uh, oh, you have the commentaries yeah, right. The commentaries are right there. Do you yeah, see yeah, mine? Yeah. I don't see you yeah. if you see my commentaries, but they're. Oh yeah, I do. man. Yeah, yeah. No, I so could just got, live I mean, you. Both of these bookshelves and the like, the bottom shelf is all Thomas, but. Both oh. of these bookshelves are all fathers. Yeah, no, it's great. So you accidentally became a Catholic. You started reading the wrong material. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I had kind of, after a decade of reading the Bible very carefully, <clears throat> I, I've read the Bible very devoutly since I was in middle school. I had, even in, in sixth grade, I had a discipler, a great guy, um, who discipled me in the Bible, and we'd read deep theological texts, at least for a sixth grader. And so I've always loved the Bible. I've always loved searching for the truth, apologetics, um, why do I believe what I believe, and and finding a way to live in conformity with that. And so, but, um, you know, I had many questions over the years, and so I'm radically simplifying the story just to keep it brief so we can get to the book. But, but the short version is, is that um, after 10 years of really probing and reading the Bible actually very carefully, um, I could not make Paul and Jesus compatible if various Protestant ideas about what Paul was teaching was true. Namely, yeah, I, got a whole, I got a whole shelf of St. Paul right below. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I couldn't do yeah. it. And so I actually fell into a oh. crisis of faith during law school. Um, it wasn't wow. a crisis of faith where I was not going to be a Christian. I, ha- I still had this deep personal trust of Jesus himself. And yeah. so I trusted he would lead me in the right direction. But I actually I stopped dating. I actually went to the law school, hopefully, so I could meet a, a beautiful woman, a Christian woman to get married to. So a beautiful, I, I actually, a beautiful I actually, Christian law student. Was that the idea? Yeah. No, that wasn't in the that wasn't in the <laughs> in the in the plan. But mm-hmm. um, but no, I, I stopped dating. I stopped evangelizing. I stopped everything like that because I simply could not articulate the gospel any longer. And and, mm. and because, like I said, because I couldn't make Jesus and Paul compatible with the Protestant reading. Um, and so, uh, I didn't know where to go. Um, I had been trying for 10 years. There were various Protestant ministers and missionary, uh, I'm sorry, mission leaders, uh, organizations, uh, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, etc. I had read quite a bit of Luther and Calvin. None of them were answering my questions. And, and on occasion, their interpretations of scripture seemed to be just blatantly contrary to the plain meaning of scripture. Um, and so I could, there'd be a million examples of that. But so I decide, you know, I'm going to finish law school. I'd always seen this multi-volume set of the Church Fathers. I've always been a bibliophile. So I see this multi-volume set through most of college, and it's, you know, $1,500 or something. Uh, well, $1,500 was like, I don't know, six months of rent, you know, so I couldn't afford it for most right. of college. But right. uh, working full-time in law, during law school uh, at the Museum of the Bible, actually. And so I just said, you know, I'm going to move back to California. That's where I'm from. Uh, We're in California. Away. We're in uh, California. Well, I was born in San Diego, but currently live in the Sacramento area. And where were you going? Where were you going to law school? What? What? Uh, Regent University. It's a what? evangelical Christian school in Virginia. Uh, it, Virginia. It punches okay. way above its right. It's actually a great school. There's mm-hmm. some great Catholic professors there. A very familial atmosphere. It was one of the reasons I went. They offered me a, a full ride scholarship, and so I was very, uh, I was very uh, blessed in that regard. Wow. And so, um, yeah, great, great community. I'm very close with many of the professors to this day. Um, you know, they, they beat all the Ivy leagues and all these moot court competitions. We've got the highest bar passage rate. So it's a great school. If you're considering law school, really? wow. consider region. Oh yeah. No, very good. So anyway, um, but I decided, you know, I'm going to move 3000 miles away in a few months. I'm just going to 
get this 38 volume set of books once I get there. So, so there's less moving. I was already going to be moving thousands. Oh, of books. dude, I know what it's like, you know, this, this whole library. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've moved, I have moved that recently myself. I had for, for a short time, I was in Florida filming some of our shows for EWTN and okay. I brought a bunch of my library with me when I rented a place there. Now I've had to bring them all back in suitcases full of books. I oh, just yeah. got to have them. I got to have them with me. You know, I don't yep. like going down. Yeah. No, but, when I was brief, when I was in DC for the white house, I, I had to ship many of my books back through UPS. I'm sorry, USPS. Expensive. Uh, expensive. Yeah, because I just, uh, even when I was in DC, I, I accumulated, I don't know, another 100 or 200 more. Yeah, so, well, we're talking, we're talking. Nervous, but, but to their credit, the Postal Service got all 40 boxes back to California, no problem. So anyway, well, I well, buy hey, the take, Church take, Fathers. We're going to take a quick break. Yeah. Talk more about the Church Fathers. We're talking with uh, Joshua Charles, who's edited this book we're about to dig into, The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. Uh, and it's a, it's a, of course, another one of those great tan books. Uh, where can they find you, Joshua? My website is joshuatcharles.com, and the book itself is on Tan's website, Amazon, all sorts of places. Awesome. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue. Through Bear's Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been? And how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion? Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, and you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. My wife always asks me to start off one of the segments with the sign of the cross in Hawaiian. Shall we do that? Sure. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't you love being Amen. able to say that, those words, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to, to bless our conversation. And so we're talking with you about libraries. And so you had had a sweet relationship with the Lord. There was a personal relationship. And yet intellectually, you were, I've never heard it said quite like that. You had trouble reconciling St. Paul with Jesus in the Protestant context. Yeah. And so, so your, your pursuit was after you began to pursue, dig more and more into the truth. And the, and the deeper you dig into that, the deeper the, the divide becomes, right? Well, the and the, the, the thing is, is I wasn't looking for the Catholic faith. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, like I said, I'm a bibliophile. So when I see this 38 volume set of books and I finally can afford it, I was like, I'm going to get it. And so uh, the, the, the volume of books, the, the volumes of books uh, ended up arriving in California, June 2017. And so I, I started reading and I was at the Museum of the Bible at this time. And I had yeah. just finished a huge project 
everybody at that point was focused on getting the museum in DC ready to go and whatnot. And so I was literally told, Josh, basically research whatever you want and we'll make it into exhibits after the museum's open. So as a blank, they, they trusted me that much. It was, it was a great job, I must say. <laughs> and so, so I opened the first volume, the Apostolic Fathers. And oh. I, start, I start reading Clement of Rome and St. Ignatius of Antioch. St. Ignatius of Antioch is my patron saint today. I call him St. Ignatius of Red Pill. And uh, I was utterly and completely shocked to discover how Catholic they were. You know, for me, uh, for me, it was just of Antioch. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. To me, oh, it, was no, Justin Mar- it was Justin Antioch. Martyr. It was Justin Martyr. As a, as a kid, I, I mean, I'm reading Justin Martyr, and right there is the prayer. Uh, you know, to to sanctify the, yeah. the Eucharist. The description. And of like, the mass. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I I hear that. I've been hearing that since I was a kid. It's the same thing. Wait, when was this written? You know. Yep. And suddenly, and that was my moment. Was that the, the primitive church was a Catholic church? Yes. So I dig on what you're saying. Go go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, Protestantism justified itself originally by a sort of a hermeneutic of restoration. And what mm-hmm. I discovered was these earliest church fathers um, were teaching things that were directly contrary to tenets that the vast majority, if not all Protestants, had rejected. An example would be uh, apostolic succession. There are some Protestants, you know, Anglicans, for example, who claim they have apostolic succession. Um, and I think some Lutherans would claim that as well. But if, even if you put Anglicans and Lutherans together, that's less than 20% of worldwide Protestantism. So but things like the sacrifice of the Eucharist, that, that, that Christians actually have a sacrifice for their worship. Um, virtually all Protestants reject this. I believe it's even specifically rejected in the 39 articles. Well, wait, 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 you're right there at the, at the, at the is it the Museum of the, of the Bible? And, 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 and where, where did the Bible come from exactly? What do they say? Yeah. How does, you know? Yeah. Well, and that, I also kept running into that. As I, kept, I mean, I've, since since then, I've read tens and tens of thousands of pages of the fathers. Um, I read them almost every day, doing a huge study for producing apologetics materials. And honestly, the conviction has only become stronger. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've often said, you know, St. John Henry Newman obviously said to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. But, yes. um, but, but I, I would say that after reading the Church Fathers, literally the only rational contenders for historic Christianity are the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox. I personally think the Catholic case is much stronger than the Orthodox. That's another discussion. Um, but over on topic after topic, including the compilation of, of the scriptures, you right. know, how did these guys put the scriptures together? Well, they did it through the tradition that had been passed down to them. There in you go. The apostolic churches. Yeah. That's it. You know, so, now, so this now idea got- that it just sort of fell out of the sky, you know, it's just, it, you know, I, I the, the more educated Protestants don't believe that. So I'm not trying to caricature them. Yeah, but they um, have to but, believe it came yeah. from somewhere. And then they, and then, and then you have the problem of well, then who who did canonize the scriptures? And, Correct. Yeah, and it has to come down to the to the. Well, now I, we, we we could talk about this forever. We but could I talk just about this to, a lot. Yeah, but for me too, you know, uh, I for me uh, a friend of mine, Stephen, he's become a friend of mine. My dad, who was a deacon in the church, sent me his book, uh, uh, um, "Crossing the Tiber." Okay. Uh, and this is when I had been a, a roaming Catholic. I had been out in the non-denominational world for quite a while, even though I had a great commitment to Christ. Is this Steve Ray's book. Steve Ray, right? Yeah. So reading, so reading that book brought me to the early church fathers, which brought me to the faith. Okay, yeah. so we got we only touched That's on awesome. that, but I want to I want to talk about you talking about historical, uh, the 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 history, you know, going all the way back to the early church fathers. But let's go back to this 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 event in, in 1884 when Pope Leo the uh, Eighth Leo the Thirteenth. Thirteenth. I'm sorry. Po- I'm sorry. I should buy, I should put my glasses on. No worries. Pope, <laughs> uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth promulgated his iconic encyclical on Freemasonry, Humanum. I should put my glasses. Humanum genus. genus. Yeah. Okay. Now, can you, can you, and and then this book that was written by Monsignor George Dillon that kind of uh, that went along with that, and uh, yeah, and can you just dig into that for us now? Uh, sure. The history there. Well, I began reading. Uh, Monsignor Dillon's book in 2020. It was originally published in 1885. So uh, Pope Leo XIII, I believe it was April, I don't have the dates in front of me, but I believe in April of 1884, he promulgated Humanum Genus. And uh, Humanum Genus is his base, his basically laying out the philosophy, even the theology of Freemasonry and why it's completely incompatible with Catholic faith. And then in October, I believe it was October in Edinburgh, um, Monsignor Dillon, who had been a missionary in Australia, he was an Irish priest, but he came back to 
uh, do a lecture uh, circuit in the UK. And uh, he gave a series of lectures on Freemasonry that was inspired by Pope Leo's encyclical. Pope Leo in his encyclical, at the, toward the end, he talks about, he calls on all clerics to tear off the mask of Freemasonry. So Monsignor Dillon took that as the cue for his lectures. And so that was his inspiration. And so these lectures were eventually reduced to a book and published the following year. And uh, the book is powerful for many, many reasons. But one of the reasons why we wanted to republish it, this is, as far as I'm aware, this is the first full republication since it was originally published. Uh, there have been some versions that that republish parts of it, but this is the first full republication. And the reason we wanted to republish it was, well, well for two reasons. One, Pope Leo XIII endorsed it. There are contemporaneous magazine articles, Catholic magazine articles, and then a letter. The letter from Leo at the beginning doesn't explicitly say this, but a letter basically of tacit endorsement from Leo at the beginning. And then there were there was a Catholic magazine that said, yes, the pontiff received Monsignor Dillon and thanked him for his work and offered to pay for the translation of this book into Italian and the printing. So Leo endorsed it. The second reason is because, frankly, it's extremely prophetic. It lays it's out like the agenda of Freemasonry. Um, I mean, we just kind of put in the description of the book, we gave just the, the bullet point so people could understand just how prophetic it, it, lo it looks was. like today's newspapers. What you're yeah. reading here. Oh, yeah. You, you, oh, can, yeah. You, can, you see it being played out every day uh, in the yes. news. Yeah. Yeah. And so we can we can dive deeply into that. Uh, most people don't realize that the ideology, the philosophy, even the theology of Freemasonry is kind of the air we breathe in many ways. Not not every element of it, but many elements of it. Uh, the idea that no religion is actually true. It's more of a vague belief in God that matters. Honestly, this is this has infected many Christians. This is one thing as a Protestant, and there are other Protestants who were upset by this too. But um, this whole sort of idea of like, well, as long as I love Jesus, then I'm good. It's like, no, Jesus gave a tangible set of commandments. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. He gave the authority to the apostles to teach the nations to observe all that he commanded them. So no, it's just not a matter of emotional connection or affinity with Jesus. It's a matter of obeying what he commanded, which we know, we know through the church. And so, um, uh, but, the, but the spirit of Freemasonry is everywhere in our society. And, and the core of it, if I could articulate what the core difference is and what ultimately Pope Leo XIII says is incompatible with Catholic faith, is in the Catholic faith, we believe we cannot be saved by our own efforts. We need God's grace. And in a tangible sense, what is God's grace? God's grace is the, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit and the Trinity itself in our souls. To be in a state of grace is to have the Holy Trinity dwelling in our souls through grace. God is an infinite creator, we're a finite creature, and that gap is bridged by grace. And so in a real sense, the way I like to articulate it is, every Catholic is called to be a temple, to, inha to be a, a habitation for God. Now the fundamental difference with Freemasonry and all occultism, all the new age occultism, there's a lot of that today, is that they will essentially say that the divinity is already in you. The divinity is already within your human nature, and you simply need to uncover it through these rituals, through these practices and whatnot. And so um, you see this sort of thinking everywhere. Frankly, it's the sort of thinking you'll see from figures like Oprah and whatnot, that God is in all of us, which is why Leo XIII and Monsignor Dillon explain in great detail how the ideology of Freemasonry, I mean, I put it the I put in the description of the book, it's animated by a socialist communist ideology. It was very much in league with that. And it's going to end in pantheistic nature worship. It already and you look yeah, at the agenda these days and it's like, yeah, climate, whoa. Yeah, climate change, right? We're talking with uh, Joshua Charles. We're going to take a quick break, Joshua, already again. Uh, his book uh, recently edited uh, the writings of Monsignor George Dillon, uh, it, which was in response to Pope Leo XIII's writing about uh, encyclical about Freemasonry. The book is The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. Where can they find you? JoshuaTCharles.com, and the books are on TAN and Amazon and, and other places. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Dan Laboon Markham with another episode of Country Up Notches. It said gunfighters filed notches on their pistol grips for every man they killed. That's mostly a myth. 
Well, anywho, the whole idea of keeping track of what we have accomplished as if to prove our worth in life is one of man's more vain endeavors. Whether it's the number of cows on our spread, the cars we drive, or the tally of likes and friends we have on Facebook, it all makes for nothing but a hill of beans, at least in God's eyes. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in taking pleasure in your accomplishments, but we've got to remember who gave us the ability to do such things. Sides on a grading curve, compared to some folks, my count is seriously low. However, Jesus did give serious commands for us to do good works. Fact is, he said that the good things we do or don't do will validate or not our eternal destiny. Yep, right there in Matthew 25. But good works aren't meant for showing off. In fact, if we do show them off, the good book says we've lost whatever reward we could have had. The gift of God's Son to us and the life he gave on Calvary's tree weren't cause of anything we did. Only notches on the cross count in the end. We can earn God's applause. Jesus provided it for us through the cross. can only be had by simple faith and a tip of the hat. Thank you. So I've advised we all quit notching our guns to show off to earn God's favor. Won't work. Never has. Never will. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to invite everyone to go to our website, deepadventure.com. The Mama Bears can join up there, become part of the, the Mama Bears. And when you do that, you, you have a whole year's curriculum on the, on the virtues that you can go through with audio, video, written content. And also you have access to all 34 episodes of Long Ride Home. Uh, some of them haven't even been aired on EW10 yet and all kinds of other things. Uh, and for the men, go there and join the man cave. And uh, you can, and you also, you have, we have 36 months of curriculum in our Bear School of Manliness, uh, which we go through together. Right now, uh, the, the curriculum we're going through this month is uh, that a man needs to be dangerous. And so we, we, we talk story about that. You go through the video, the audio, the written, take a self assessment, and then we dialogue once a month through a Zoom meetup. And, uh, and once a year, we get together for a big meetup uh, in Florida. And so, uh, but we, what we love about the School of Manliness is that. Not only do you go through this with other men, but you as fathers can have your son who's, say, 13, 14, confirmation age or older. He can have his own login, and you can lead your, each of your sons through that curriculum. You can have you know, meaningful dialogue with them as you watch the videos or, or read through the content together. And uh, they don't get to have a, a access to the man cave. That's just for grown men. Uh, that which is our, our non-Facebook community site, which is right there on our website. So go to deepadventure.com and, and look around, check it all out. We have our web store there and a lot of other stuff. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter too. That's why you can you can get the video version of our EWTN radio show there. Uh, so check it out, deepadventure.com. We're talking with Joshua Charles and his, how cool, this is just such a gift to the church, the writing of this book. 
The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Church and Christian Civilization, based on the writings of Pope Leo the Thirteenth in eighteen eighty four, his his um, encyclical and the right and the lectures and writings of Monsignor George Dillon, uh, which was um, which was uh, uh, approved by the, the the Pope Pope Leo the Thirteenth. So, and we're basically it gets down to Freemasonry. You know, um, <clears throat> one of the concepts of Freemasonry is this concept of gnosis, having this secret knowledge. Yeah, and, and I kind of see that on both sides of the spectrum these days. I see people that have these uh, on one side. They go, "Well, we know what's we 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 have this this knowledge of what uh, of what the um, the radical left is doing. We have the secret knowledge." I'm not going to go into details about it, but it's almost like it's a gnosis on the conservative side <clears throat> about what what is happening behind the behind the the Wizard of Oz curtain. And then, of course, there's the Freemasonry itself. So it's somewhere in there. Uh, there's there's truth and there's wisdom, but you're talking about how how um, Oprah Winfrey and those they'll say, well, we all have the divinity within them, and you hear this statement all the time, and it just makes me <laughs> upsets me. Well, tell us your truth on this, yeah, as opposed to the truth. And, and when Pilate interviewed Jesus, was talking to Jesus, interrogating Jesus, he 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 asked this question kind of sarcastically. Well, what is truth? And yeah. truth truth is a person. Truth was standing right there in front of him. And so tell us tell us why more about this Freemasonry and why this is their agenda, why it's so, so what we're seeing played out right now. So let me, uh, as a, a precatory statement, and then I kind of lay out the grand narrative of all this. One of the reasons we wanted to republish this book, one of the reasons I wanted to republish this book, I was reading this book originally during the lockdowns. <laughs> yeah. So, so that... much of the worldwide Catholic Church is, is not publicly celebrating easter and you're just becoming and you just became a catholic in your life previous year yeah <laughs> yeah yeah for so for not publicly celebrating easter for i believe the first time and you know uh since at least the the peace of the church with constantine and 313 and so uh that was remarkable to me and um i think one of the main impetuses for for republishing it is this uh these things cannot be dismissed. There are, yeah. I, see two, I teach, see two extremes as well. On one extreme is this sort of ostrich head buried in the sand that, that, that wants to act as if everything's fine, everything's normal, uh, nothing to see here, you know, and, and that's simply not true. The other extreme is there's a Freemason under every rock, and that's not true either, um, or a Freemasonic ideology under every rock, or every, bi every decision a bishop makes that's contrary to what I prefer is the result of Freemasonry or, or something or, of that or, a, sort. or a politician or, or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so, and, and Leo the 13th even says, and, and so does Monsignor Dillon in this book, that that is not the case. He's, he's, he, Leo the 13th explicitly says, we cannot blame all the problems in the church on Freemasonry. Can't do it. It's not true. Once you do that, um, it, 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 once you do that, it destroys any argument that you have. Yeah. For the truth. Yeah. Well, what Leo the 13th says, though, is he lays out what the broad agenda is. And Monsignor Dillon goes into great depth on this. It's in the description of the book, you know, destruction of the papacy. It's temporal authority first, which succeeded. And it's spiritual authority, uh, total separation of church and state, the moral degradation of the population, easy divorce laws, basically wanting to make marriage as easy to break as a business contract, if not easier, uh, secularized education. Uh, socialist and communist ideology united with all this. There's a very specific reason why. I'll get to that in a second. And it's ultimately going to end in a sort of pantheism, a worship of, of creation. Pantheism is the worship of creation. And so when somebody says my truth, they're ultimately, they don't realize it. Many don't realize it, at least. I'm sure some do. But implicitly, they are claiming divinity. Exactly. You know, anytime somebody yeah. claims my truth, they're they're claiming the ability to dictate they're claiming the knowledge of good and evil in the in the sense that makes them like gods which is exactly well, what the serpent tempted our, our first parents with I, I was talking with someone the other day um I, I, I love these kind of conversations that just kind of happen at coffee shops and we we're talking about beauty and uh this person started to say yeah nature is so beautiful um the bird a plant a tree myself you know we're all we all uh, have this uh this display of our of beauty, um, and it's equal. You know, the the, the beauty of a bird, the, the the almost like the imparting wisdom to the bird. Um, 
and uh, and and the and the human were equal, you know. And I go, you know, well, every I said every every one of these things, uh, the ocean, a bird, a beautiful puppy, all have their dignity, but it's not comparable to human dignity to the uh, because we're of incomparable worth. Why do we know that Jesus Christ became uh, man and even died to save us? So to say that a bird and 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 uh, uh, the forest or something like that has the same dignity as a human being is kind of what people are, are standing on. And the way that this person was saying, talking about vibrations from this <laughs> and that, that's, that's definitely imparting a certain divinity to them. Yeah. And, yeah. And, Jesus. And, and, yeah. yeah the ahead, second sorry. person of the Trinity didn't assume the nature of a dog as much yeah, as I love dogs. Right. And this was just, you know? this was just a few days ago. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Well, and this gets to, there's a term I coined in the introduction and I'm, you know, I come from Protestantism. So, in Protestantism, not every Protestant believes this, but there's five solas, you know, sola fide, sola scriptura, things of that sort. And so I, I describe what I, this, this, the ultimate crux of free Masonic ideology and why it's incompatible with Catholicism is what I call sola natura, nature alone. Uh -huh. And again, that gets back to what I yeah. said earlier, that all Freemasonry, all occult ideology, whether it's called Freemasonry or something else, it all ultimately comes down to the fundamental contention that the divinity is already within you. And this actually goes to Satan's fall himself. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas describes very carefully, uh, or very interestingly, rather, although carefully too, that's St. Thomas, but um, <laughs> why Satan fell. And Satan fell ultimately because he wanted to enjoy the beatific vision without grace. He thought that his nature alone, his angelic nature alone, should have been sufficient to enjoy the beatific vision. And that's essentially what he was tempting our, our first parents with, is you can be like God's, without the tree of life. You can be like gods without grace. You can be like gods without the Holy Trinity dwelling in your souls. And, and so that's where the gnosis comes in. It, it, I think sometimes people overuse the term gnosis. Like anytime somebody claims to know something that is not broadly known, they call it gnosis. That's not quite, I'm not saying you were doing that, but that's not quite the right definition. The, 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 the definition of, I think a good working definition of gnosis in this sense would be that by obtaining a certain set of a certain knowledge set that one actualizes the divinity within you. I think that's fundamentally what. Well, what and, and, so let's go to that. So I'll, I'll hear people that go into these uh, radically conservative conspiracy theories, you know, that I know yeah. I'm not, I don't have my head, I'm not an ostrich, but I see, hear them say this. And then there's so, so you got to do your own research. You got to discover this. Like you got to right. know the truth yeah. and the truth will set you free. And I go, well, has it set you free? What, what, yeah. you know, that yeah. knowing all this truth that no one else knows is that is that is that because you don't look free you look freaked <laughs> out and worried and yeah. and you you know and, and and what good has this done to anybody all your research you know what why don't you spend some time going deeper with Christ you know, spending time no you're totally right well, so there, have, there is, yeah. mm -hmm. so there, there, we need to know this but uh, in that sense it becomes it becomes gnostic because at least this is a secret yes. knowledge that's going to empower me well what has it done for you? you already have a relationship with Jesus what is all this what why is this the, the focal point of your life, you know, as opposed to um, meditating on God's word and, and reading uh, other books and fellow fellowshipping with Christians and moving on in, in the, in the works of mercy, you're just making a big pile of, 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 of worry and anxiety for yourself and for everybody else. So that's why we want to dig deeper into this book with you. This is uh, Joshua uh, Charles and his, and his uh, edited the book, the war of the antichrist with the church, the War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization, based on Pope Leo the Thirteenth's encyclical about Freemasonry and uh, Father, I mean Monsignor George Dillon's writings on it. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards, and now instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air. You can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting 
the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak Adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Bear and Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. still listening i thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station while well, you asked for it here is more of the bear wasnick adventure aloha back uh, to the bear wasnick adventure we have with us today monsignor george i mean <laughs> a book you just got promoted i appreciate a bear but yeah exactly yeah i was gonna make you saint earlier but yeah so- yeah Monsignor, uh, 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 a book edited by Joshua Charles based on the writings of Monsignor George Dillon. What do we see played out right now today uh, in the agenda of Freemasonry? I mean, look at I look at some of the things that are happening, and it looks like the goal is basically to just destroy everything. Destroy let me, all well, let me bridge what we were saying earlier, because I, I completely agreed with you about Gnosis, that what is happening, this could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> What's happening a lot today, though, is very many people on the conservative Christian kind of side of things they don't realize how much they are falling for a very occult agenda, frankly. Um, I think the QAnon stuff is very dark. I didn't want um, to say it, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, we yeah. can have further conversations about that some other day. But no, you're right. But the term that many of them use for attaining this gnosis that somehow liberates is awakening. I'm hearing that term a lot. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with the term. That's a know? gnarly like, term, though. You know, yeah, yeah, just like there's nothing inherently wrong with knives or guns, right? It's how people use them. But uh, but th- that is the term that is very often being used, and it's basically this idea that by awakening, you break free from the control matrix. All of this is Gnosticism. All of it's occultism. That's another discussion. But here, So here's the grand narrative, and this is really important for people to get. So we know from St. Augustine and from many other fathers, they talk about this idea, but St. Augustine, you know, preeminently, the city of God and the city of man. Right. Mm, well said. Yeah. So what happens, though, is and many of the fathers talk about this. It's actually one of the reasons I'm Catholic, because many people will bring up, well, what about all the corruption in the church? What about the bad you know, bishops, bad popes, maybe? Um, what about that? Well, we know from St. Augustine. Sorry, I can't make a perfect Venn diagram. But, you know, if, if you had a Venn diagram like this of the city of God and the city of man, the church and the world, there's an overlap. And the church fathers have always taught this based off of parables like the wheat and the chaff or the sheep and the goats and whatnot. And Jesus says that the wheat is planted in the vineyard, but then there are weeds that grow up with it. And the disciples ask him, should we pick up all the weeds? And he says, no, leave that to the end, leave that to the end. And so there are weeds that grow up with the wheat throughout the history of the church. And so, but there is this dark side, quote unquote, of the visible church on earth. The the church in heaven is perfectly pure reigning with Christ, right? The perfect, the, uh, the church suffering is in purgatory, being purged of its sins, but it will be in the church triumphant eventually. But on in the church militant here on earth, there is this dark side in the visible church. Many fathers talk about this, that there are, frankly, there are infiltrators that get into the church. We we know this from our Lord's own passion. 11 well, you, of his look, 12 apostles yeah. left him when he most well, needed them. Well, know? who was the infiltrator? Judas. Yeah, well, and then Judas's betrayal, there were a lot of, you know, many of the other apostles left him. They, it wasn't right. as bad uh, yeah. as Judas, but yeah, they, they, uh, even they Peter. They abandoned him. They abandoned yeah. him for a season. Even yeah. Peter abandoned him. So only John and our Saint Lady, Saint John and, and Our Lady were at the cross with a few other women. So what am I saying? What happened with the incarnation of our Lord, the assumption of human nature by the second person of the Trinity, was that, a to, to use a phrase, a new world order was inaugurated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's very interesting. I saw an article the other day that talked about uh, 98% of human beings who have ever lived on planet Earth have lived since uh, Christ came. 
So literally up to the point of Christ, only about 2% of all the human beings who had ever lived had been alive. And so scripture talks about Christ coming in the fullness of time. Well, what was controlling the world up to that point? Pagan worship, usually. The Jews were an occasional exception, but even the Jews kept falling into idol worship. What does Paul call the idols that they're worshiping? The, the, they're demons. The, the idols worshiped by the nations are demons, he says. So it is active, satanic, demonic control of the nations of the world through idol worship. That is the, that is the order that Jesus Christ came to destroy, okay? Now, what's very interesting is, is I could, there's so many more details of this, so I'll give the very, very, very short version. Masonry and all occultism believes itself to be the inheritor of those pagan mysteries. They yes. say it over right. and over again. They right. say it in their own sources. And they, they, this is why they see consistently, it's another reason I'm Catholic, they consistently see the Catholic Church as their key enemy. Isn't yeah, that interesting? Yeah, Protestants and whatnot they don't like, but the Catholic Church is the big kahuna. Right. It is the enemy par excellence. Even their allegories about Jacques de Molay, he was the head of the Knights Templar who is who was executed for heresy in the 1300s. They they see his execution as basically this alliance of king, you know, throne and altar to destroy this Gnostic knowledge by which humanity's divinity is awakened. They see this as something they are meant to revenge. Masonry sees itself as revenging that act in many ways. So masonry, occultism, it's ultimately about reviving that pagan mystery system that was suppressed by the Catholic Church reviving it again and how much more time we got in the segment you got about four minutes four minutes okay good uh i know know we got to keep with the schedule no so it's very interesting this is a huge topic but just to give people a a a a hint and i don't talk about this much in the book but but um in second thessalonians 2 paul talks about the antichrist and this is obviously in the title of the book second thessalonians 2 is very interesting because there paul calls antichrist the man of lawlessness so then the question arises, wow. yeah. okay, well, if Antichrist is the man of lawlessness, what has God established in the world for the sake of lawfulness? And the church has always taught that those are the two powers, the temporal power and the spiritual power. The temporal power is governments, and the spiritual power is the church. They, they used to work the- hand in hand, but they used to work hand in hand. Yeah, and it was never a perfect system. I'm not here to say it wasn't. It, Christendom well, was not a utopian system. That'll That's happen in heaven. Was. I mean, we're on earth. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. Um, it was not a utopian system. But basically, the idea was that once the incarnation came into the world, once Christ assumed human nature, all human be- he became king, okay? And all temporal societies owe an allegiance to him, and mm-hmm. they are ultimately capable of reaching their final end the be- eternal life in heaven purpose, the vision, purpose, yeah, yeah. through the spiritual power, the temporal society, the British empire, the Roman empire, the American empire, Spanish empire, city states, Athens, whatever. None of those temporal societies can reach their final end, uh, which is heaven without the church, without the, t- the, the spiritual society and authority of the church. So a temporal power ordered by the spiritual power is what holds back lawlessness. Is, is my theory. And, and that's so, the, go ahead, go ahead. Well, and Paul says that this restraint will be removed and that once it's removed, Antichrist will appear. So I don't dive too much into this in the introduction of the book, but essentially I think there's a very strong case to be made that as those two sources of lawfulness are destroyed, Paul ta- talks about a great apostasy uh, as a great rebellion against those two great sources of lawfulness uh, are carried out in the world. And masonry was very much behind a lot of that. A lot of the revolutions against Christian princes, Protestant and Catholic, but mostly Catholic, um, that this would lead to the antichrist. Monsignor Dillon believes he outlines in great detail that, you know, masonry is directed by a central source who has a central leader that is unknown to virtually everybody involved, but that these leaders proceed in succession. It's very much like a dark sort of apostolic succession. And that the final leader in succession of that will be the Antichrist. And so masonry not only sees itself as restoring these pagan mysteries, which it sees as the source of knowledge and enlightenment after it's been long suppressed by the Catholic Church, but it sees itself as inaugurating this sort of new age for and, humanity, and, this sort of Novus Ordo Seclorum. Say that again. 
Well, this sort of Novus Ordo Seclorum, you know, this which, new order for the ages, which was actually inaugurated with Christ, but they think they're going to redo it. It's the it's it's the yeah. Um, counterfeit. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we're run, we're running a little bit out of, out of time here, but <clears throat> you, 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 we see that being acted out in the world today. I mean, uh, it's called the Bible calls it the spirit of lawlessness. Yes, and that's what the we're seeing. And there's th- there's two elements of it. There's the anarchy that we see in the streets, um, the the open rebellion in the streets, but it's also that the lawlessness when you go back to there's the commandments of jesus of course thomas aquinas had a lot of knowledge about natural law and we could go we can go back to that in our catechisms that are largely based on on his writings when we when we reject natural law like for example the complementarity between a man and a woman the immutability of of the genders and things like that it begins the downfall uh when we when we when we uh uh have sex outside of marriage and men no longer have to be responsible, like St. John Paul II, you know, um, love and responsibility or, or, or the encyclical Humanae Vitae, you know, that was, I guess, about 50, 60 years ago now. We're seeing a lawlessness, and we're wondering, why do they just want to destroy things? Why, you know, and that's what Satan does. He comes to steal, kill, well, and destroy. Well, let me explain something. You got, really you, got, you, you got 20 seconds, 30 the, seconds. This is extremely significant because the church has always taught that nature is not capable of attaining its end without grace. So right. what happens is, is when you do not have grace in our, your soul because of original sin, oh, well, even though yeah. you lose yeah. the ability to not only perceive, but to act according to the natural law. So it's not that, and that's the fundamental crux. Masonry believes you do not need grace for nature to be its highest self. So yes. when you lose well, grace, so it, nature regresses into a sort of right. nature. Yeah. Right. It's grace fulfilling nature is what we, what we, yes. but we're not going to do something contrary to nature. Oh my gosh, we've run out of time. The book is by Joshua Charles. He's the editor of the book on the writings of Monsignor George Dillon, uh, uh, The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. It's a it's really kind of a book you really can't put down, although I had to yesterday. I got I got interrupted in my day, but I'm looking forward to finishing this book. Uh, where can they find you again? JoshuaTCharles.com. And the final thing I would say is don't focus on Freemasonry, focus on Christ. Amen. But don't deny that there are very dark forces in this world fundamentally trying to overturn Christian civilization. There are the the Roman pontiffs are not tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. Many of them warned about this. It cannot be dismissed. Praise God. Well said. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Okay, so I'm going to be very delicately trying to do the control, sir. I'm going to stop recording. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.